Hi, welcome. Uh, just to make sure you're in the right place, this is a core conversation uh, about the future directions for Drupal accessibility. And uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Andrew, and I work at Anatech, uh, who last night at the Irish Web Awards are the best digital agency in Ireland. Just thought I'd slip that in there because. Uh, we took four awards, and we're going to be insufferable about it today. <laughs> so, um, but as well as working for Anatech, I've been in the Drupal community for a number of years now. And earlier this year, uh, Mike Gifford, who's one of the accessibility maintainers, uh, he asked me to join him as another core accessibility maintainer, uh, in particular working on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Mike and Jesse are the existing ones for Drupal 8 and they're both in North America. So yeah, this summer I became an accessibility core maintainer and I'm still kind of finding my way around it and learning what it's like to, what it's like to be a maintainer and uh, finding immediately that uh, my, particip my participation in issues is changing. I no longer sort of ask timidly, can we do this, maybe explore this idea? I'm like, we should do this. and. Uh, also, I'm um, enjoying filing issues and making plans and uh, knowing that I don't have to be the one who fixes it myself, but uh, instead I'm spending a lot more time looking at more and more issues and triage and review. And uh, What I'm going to do today, then, is to let you know where accessibility is at currently in Drupal. Uh, I'm not going to talk about anything before the Drupal 8 release. Uh, I'm going to start with that as a brilliant starting point and I'm going to tell you about some of the things that are currently broken, a few bugs that we've found, uh, some of the uh, little features that we're bringing in as new stuff and I'm going to talk about some of the things I think are really exciting that we could do to continue innovating with accessibility. Uh, when I uh, made the session proposal uh, just a few months ago. I was brand new to being the accessibility maintainer and I just had this, uh, it was only a big long session proposal and it was like a, a big brain dump and I realized there's no way I'm going to fit all of that into one session. But um, if there was something you saw there, it's still fair game for the questions, okay? And I did think about whether to focus on the strategic initiatives uh, because we saw a lot of interface changes coming in there. Um, some of those are well underway and we've got the outside in module and uh, I tried to keep up with it but then I did some traveling over the summer. So now, but now it's there, it's working, it's a, an experimental module and we can do some proper accessibility testing on it now. Uh, so I might, I might not talk too much about the strategic initiatives. Instead, I'm going to talk about some of the things that have been in the back of my mind over the last year or so, and which I'm now going to introduce as, as uh, proposals, a kind of a little roadmap for where we go with accessibility. Uh, there's, I don't expect you have to know too much about the nitty-gritty on the technical side of accessibility. Um, I did make that, you know, that's why it's an intermediate talk. We... Uh, you know, it's not going to be too much technical expertise, but uh, I think it's worth recapping to check what that everyone knows what ARIA is. I'm expecting everyone knows what JavaScript and HTML and CSS is, and I expect you know your way around the Drupal interface. But hands up if you know ARIA. About half of you. Okay, so it's worth stating that uh, ARIA is another um, technology from the W3C, and it's intended as a set of... Uh, it describes the state of user interface widgets and controls in a way that is machine readable, a way that we can pass up through accessibility APIs in the host operating systems to, so that they will reach assistive technology such as screen readers and switch access and other kinds of controls. Uh, there's a couple of examples here. We see some, uh, some of it is static. Um, yeah, it's a way of, uh, you can use it to create complex um, ways of labeling things or, or occasionally there's a need to override the way that something's labeled. Um, you can also create, um, describe things as user interface components. Here I've given an example of a tab list 
which doesn't have an equivalent in HTML, but we do find in the desktop operating system. And the last example there, we see an area expanded, uh, and that's something that we can use to communicate the state of something. An example here would be our drop button uh, widget or our uh, details and summary widget that we use extensively all across the core uh, Drupal admin uh, interface. And if you're sighted, you can very easily see what has changed on the page when you click on the drop button and you see it drop down and you see uh, a whole bunch of extra options. But uh, we also want to convey that information to screen readers and other assistive tech. And ARIA Expanded is the machine readable way of telling a screen reader that the, uh, the button is now open. And so that will toggle between uh, true and false as you press the uh, as you press the control. So our details and summary widget does indeed do this and I know I know that our drop button doesn't communicate its state to a screen reader so that's something we'll want to fix and it's a simple pattern to do so. So what's happened since Drupal 8 came out? Now we have uh, still gone and carried on making changes in accessibility. We have found a bunch of uh, bugs and I've uh, I'm going to show you this group in particular because they all relate to keyboard behaviors and uh, many of us will be going around using a trackpad or a mouse or some other pointer device and uh, as the developers who are working on things in the issue queue and we may not be doing much manual testing on uh, keyboard behavior. So some things that happened, um, we noticed that Ajax buttons, you'll, you'll see Ajax buttons around if you've got an image field and you've out uploaded an image, you'll see a little thumbnail of the image and next to it there's a remove button if the editor wants to get rid of that image. Uh, if you focus on that button, you'll see a focus style and if you press enter, you expect it to operate the button and it doesn't. Uh, another place that you'll see that is the field UI when you're on manage display, you'll find that some field formatters have settings and you open them with a little button that has a cogwheel on it. Uh, that button is also affected. Uh, the good news is that we have a fix for this and it's uh, there's a patch ready. Um, some other stuff, uh, we found uh, uh, the CK editor, if you are configuring your text formats and you want to decide which buttons you're going to include in your editor toolbar, um, there's a, a, a button in there which lets you change the names of the groups and, and, and fiddle with that and it turns out that, as far as I can tell, that button never worked with the keyboard. Um, but we have that fixed. Um, there are some missing focus styles in the CK Editor UI. You, uh, Barris, in fact, in the front row here, is uh, working on a patch with that. And there, the, the editor works. You can uh, add buttons, uh, move buttons in and out of the text editor that you're going to be configuring. And it works quite well with the screen reader. Uh, but if you're a sighted keyboard user, uh, you can actually operate it just about you can in that the buttons there are focusable but you have no idea which button is focused because there isn't a visual indication uh, recently I just found out that some of our dialogues don't quite work properly when we uh, in views UI uh, you uh, a lot of the settings there open up a dialogue and if you operate that with a keyboard it will whenever the uh, dialogue opens the focus will shift to the inside of the dialogue uh, that also causes a screen reader to announce the fact that it's entered a dialogue, which is really important. Well, I found that if you're on the block layout UI, um, that dialogue doesn't focus the content of the dialogue. You're still focused on the button that opened it. If you press tab, you straight away get into the uh, dialogue, so something's just not quite right there. Some other bugs um, which we found, which are not related to keyboard uh, exactly, um, we have some labels, uh, a labeling system. We use ARIA labeled by so that our menu uh, blocks, uh, if you're, you, you know that menus have user menu and main menu, and those are the names of the menus that you, you can configure in the menu UI. And you can choose to hide the block title or show the block title. Uh, but if you hide it, you, you still have a, a label. Uh, telling you what the name of that navigation landmark is. 
and it turns out that they got broken. Now, Bartik and Seven were unaffected. This was after we decided that, um, you, you know, we we're thinking about how to stabilize our core themes. And so the bug is actually in the template in the system module. Um, uh, we have fixed it, and I got sign off as well that we could make that change in the stable templates too. Um, so that's really, really important for anyone who's making a custom theme and isn't extending Classy. Uh, the, the, it's interesting the way that that bug got introduced too, because uh, we've done a lot of really sensible refactoring in other systems. So there's a lot of CSS cleanup, uh, the best practices of CSS. We, we uh, generally speaking, we no longer use ID selectors in our CSS, uh, just class selectors. And so there's been a lot of refactoring there. And once you are no longer using your ID selectors and some of the classes have been removed, because now we have the classy theme, uh, meant that from the system module, uh, we could remove some of those classes that are actually provided by the classy theme. So there was an issue which was to go and clean up some of the classes that we never use. And sure enough, that went into the template and it took out a whole load of classes. And you wouldn't guess it by the message that appeared on the uh, git commit, but it also removed a couple of ID attributes from the template. And those ID attributes were no longer being used by CSS, but they were being used by the ARIA reference system. And so now you would hear that you were in a navigation, navigation, navigation. You couldn't tell these navigation blocks apart, but by fixing that, uh, you can tell you're in the user menu navigation, you're in the main menu navigation. Uh, we've also dis uh, discovered that some templates uh, aren't respecting the uh, ability to hide the field but include it as an invisible thing. This is on the again on the field settings UI where you say, do I want to show the label for this field or hide it? Uh, there is an option to hide it uh, visually but still leave it there so that a screen reader can hear it. And some templates aren't respecting that. Um, so that's something we, we need to fix. Uh, in fact, I I'd kind of like to take that out of templates and have it further up in the uh, pre-process hooks so that it's harder for a thema to inadvertently break. Uh, and then here comes a big one. Um, inline form errors is still an experimental module and in, uh, in we've now got quite a number of experimental modules in core and Dries mentioned this in his keynote that uh, we need to move them towards a stable capacity. They can't just live in the experimental package forever. We need to move them towards stability or possibly make the decision to remove them from core. Um, inline film errors became an experimental module uh, very shortly before the release of Drupal 8. It was intended that this stuff would be just part of the core system. Um, but some outstanding bugs meant that it was um, something that would delay the release of Drupal 8. And so uh, there was a valiant effort of refactoring. We took it out of the core system and made it an experimental module. Uh, but it still has some blockers and uh, it's still a little bit rough around the edges and we need to get it out there. And so we have until the 8.3 release to make some serious progress on this. Um, it's at risk of removal and it's a real shame because we do have a great roadmap. We know what the problems are that we need to fix. What we don't have is many people working on it. And so I just want to highlight this. Um, the pattern that we're building with it, the idea that we uh, are placing the form errors in line and that we're placing links in the summary message at the start of the page. When you, when you submit a form, it comes back with, say, three errors. You'll see a message at the top saying which those errors are, and they contain links so you can jump to them more quickly if you're using a screen reader or just uh, if you're a sighted keyboard user, if you're using switch access or some other mode of interaction. And it's, we have a saying in the community about getting off the island and, and stuff that's proudly found elsewhere. And those, those came in as really important philosophies for us in the D8 development cycle. And inline form errors is one of those things. It's very much in line with current thinking in the accessibility community more widely. Um, that was a, many of the experimental modules that we have are forming part of a, 
uh, the, the strategic initiatives, so the migrate modules, the uh, workflow initiative modules, and the uh, editor experience stuff like outside in. Uh, but not all modules are part of, no, they don't have that blessed status of being part of a, a, a strategic initiative. The inline form errors module and also the big pipe module, these are accessibility, usability, and big pipe is about performance. These are not the strategic initiatives, these are the uh, these are the regression gates that we guard against. So whilst the strategic initiatives are moving our product forward uh, at the bleeding edge, these modules are important to get to a stable situation because they're actually moving the regression gates forward behind us as we go along. So it is the most important priority for us right now is to get inline for form errors sorted. Um, I still haven't got my head around the exact full list of everything we need to do on that as a new maintainer, but it's, it's becoming the thing that I have to be looking at more. But what I actually want to talk about for the most of the thing is stuff that I personally find exciting and we haven't talked about at all yet in Drupal Core. So we have a bunch of uh, new features that we're bringing in, and the great thing is that our point releases, uh, our six monthly releases mean that we can bring things in as new features uh, when they're good and ready, and we can continue to just drip feed more and more accessibility improvements in. We've gone past the time where the Drupal 7 uh, came out and then we thought, oh, well, now that took three years. And now we're going to say, well, we, we, we have to look at the state of uh, support for ARIA in uh, screen readers and uh, browsers and go with what works because we might not have another stable D8 release for another three, five years. Uh, but the six monthly releases uh, blow that all away. It's not just every, every subsystem in Drupal is going to benefit from this. So the CKI editor Ali Checker. It was a proprietary plugin which you had to pen, spend money for and it was a uh, it's produced by CK Source uh, who are behind the CK editor thing but they've uh, given it the GPL license now so we want to bring it into core. Um, it's we are blocked on an upstream packaging issue which gives us a JavaScript performance problem. <laughs> but um, there is a contrib module available for those of you who want it. But uh, if we can get this by 8.3, that'll be fantastic. Here's what it looks like. We see the editor, we get an extra button in the toolbar uh, with a little icon of a person, and that's the accessibility checker. And it goes and finds your, uh, your accessibility problems inside one of those rich text fields. And then it kind of gives you this little wizard-like interface. It tells you the seven errors, and you can skip through them. And it offers you advice on how to fix it and an inline form to help you just do that quick fix here and now. Uh, this will be a brilliant thing to have in our rich text editor by default. Views tables with two headers. I can't tell you, this is one of the things I am so excited about. I've got, a, there's a bunch of images here which show that uh, there are different structures for tables. We see one with, uh, just a set of headers across the top uh, and then uh, other kinds of table where it makes sense to put headers across the top and down the sides and then there are a few more complicated ones like the uh, sort of two rows of headers which have you know multiple column spans and things but currently the output from views is just one of those just the top row as headers and someone actually submitting a bug report saying accessible tables must have column uh, column headers and that's not quite true actually these images come from the accessibility tutorials at the W3C but thinking about it it's a great feature request could we just you know have a easy setting in views to say actually I want to pick one of my fields and say that that's going to get column header uh, row header status and here's a use case this is a, a snapshot from the foyer downstairs that's a DrupalCon uh, schedule so timetables uh, also product comparisons uh, track listings on a playlist uh, these are things where it makes sense to identify one of your columns as being uh, uh, a good one for uh, treating as a row level header uh, so we have a patch in progress, and here's a uh, we need a design review because here's what it looks like in Bartic. I've taken the content listing and just taken the node title and said treat that as a 
row level header. <coughs> um, it's great for accessibility because whilst you're using uh, assistive tech like a screen reader, you many screen readers provide tools so you can uh, query where you are in a in a in a table and make uh, and discover things. Like, I'm on this cell, but which cell is it? You're in you're in row three, column five. Uh, you can ask ask a screen reader what. What what the headers for this, and it will tell you. Actually, you have two headers in this case. Uh, the screenshot we also see here is that the it's actually the second column which we're treating as the headers. You'll see that those check boxes are the first one, but the one we're using as the um, headers is the second row. So it's flexible enough to support what's called tables with an offset column header. It's yeah, and it's actually just one little select box in the UI uh, for the views tables. You just say use, yeah, none is an option, but you can say use this one. Um, we're not proposing to change any of the views that we're using in core, but we think this is a really great site builder tool, uh, just like the accessibility checker in CK Editor. These are tools which are going to help authors uh, make decisions about which affect accessibility. Drupal Announce was a, a new API we brought in in Drupal 8. Has anyone uh, heard of it? Uh, has anyone listened to it? Yeah, it's, um, it uses ARIA and it uses uh, JavaScript to manage an invisible div, uh, but that invisible div is marked up in a way that a screen reader will read out anything that changes there. Um, so we can use this to sneak in some custom announcements, uh, brief custom announcements, please, uh, to uh, ju just give a few changes, give an indication of what changed on the page. We use it in toolbar when you change from uh, the horizontal toolbar to moving it to the right-hand side as a, a, a different mode of looking at the toolbar. Uh, there's an extra announcement to say that just happened. And we use it in module filter. I thought we'd have a quick demo. So we've been to this page. Uh, let me just skip to main content site administration. Shut up. Right. If you learn to use a screen reader, you'll learn to use the uh, shut up key. It's the first control you'll learn. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to skip. If we're in the um... filter modules with hint filter by name and description, edit text, search entry, enter a part of the module. The idea is that we have a text field here where if we start typing in it, it's going to um, reduce that big long list. Now there's no page refresh here, we're not sending back to the server and getting a brand new page, we're all just filtering dynamically, locally. Um, so we need to communicate that change to a screen reader. So if I type the word cache in here, um, the, the core has two modules with the word cache in the title. I've got, we're going to hear that more than that because I, I can detect the test modules. but. E. Eight modules are available in the modified list. Eight modules are available in the modified list uh, was the feedback that a screen reader user gets. It's minimal. That is a short message that tells you the essential change that just happened. Something that is very, very apparent if you're looking at the screen and you can see the visual change happen. Uh, it doesn't handle plurals, right? Uh, there's a patch in there's a patch for that. So we'll come back to this interface later. So there are more places in Drupal core we can use Drupal Announce. Here we're uh, rounding out places where we've missed an opportunity. We have quite a lot of filterable lists. If you're adding search criteria or sort criteria to one of your views, you get a dialogue uh, and you can filter by the category or search for a keyword. Oh, I need to add the title. And you see, so type title and do 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 do. It reduces your number of options. Well, we can make the same kind of announcement there. Um, the block listing also does that. There, there might be things that we can do with uh, if you have a uh, Ajax views enabled, and Ajax is being used for um, exposed filters to just do an Ajax get a updated version of the view. There's no full page refresh going on. Um, I'm just so you know, a full page refresh will normally have the title of the page announced by the screen reader. That's the title that you find in the HTML head. Uh, but without a full page request, uh, refresh, you don't have that. There are lots of places we could use it in contrib, and in fact, refreshness module, um, that's 
a beautiful thing, which is a, a performance enhancing module, and it has no configuration. You turn it on and your site gets faster. Who wouldn't shove that in? But it does so by avoiding full page refreshes. And so the title of the page that you've just navigated to is missing. And straight away I could see that this was a use for um, Drupal Announce. And so uh, Refreshless is still a contrib alpha module, but it does indeed uh, announce the name of the page that you would have got if you had done a full page re refresh. Um, views load more. Um, is one of those things where you have a button at the bottom and you go loads another 10 teasers. Um, that would benefit from one. Uh, I must get around, or maybe one of you could get around to uh, making a contrib patch for that. Um, there are other places we could use them. The Facet and the Search API are, are coming along well in Drupal, but uh, those can be run by an Ajax thing. So it's particularly useful there because you might have your facets down in a sidebar and the results are displayed in the main content area. And if you're dynamically changing those as you're ticking boxes in the facets, uh, a sighted user can see the new results are there. Um, what we would like to do is say, you know, Drupal Announce would be a great way to read out the crucial piece of information, probably the header of the view, where, you know, where it's telling you there's eight results for 80 litre backpacks. And those are your, um, it tells you, it reminds you what facets you've got and it tells you how many results you've got. And that's important because you might not be finished with uh, messing around in the facets in the sidebar. You might want to pick a few more and you know bring that bring that result count down. Um, there's some other current stuff. Um, we some of our focus styles are way too subtle. Um, in that some of them are really bright and bold, and some of them you just have uh, difficulty seeing. I'm going to show you one. If we go. D8, oh, hang on, no, let's Delta go. Delta modules, Chromebox is now inactive. inactive. I'm going to go to the um, manage display for a node type. Oh, here we are. So we're listing the content types. You see there's the article and the basic page. And over in the operations, we've got one of those drop buttons. Now, um, I'd like you all to close your eyes. And we'll have a little experiment. And I'm going to press tab a whole bunch of times to uh, get somewhere. And you can open your eyes and tell me, can anyone now tell me which element is in focus? <laughs> What's going to happen when I press the enter key? Any guesses? Wrong. No, it was the drop button. Uh, Arrow doesn't have a good focus style, and it's because uh, we're really using a hover style. And I'm just showing you this because if we are hovering, uh, a sighted user is following the mouse pointer and has an extra clue, right? And we see this tiny, subtle background color change. It's too subtle. We need something stronger than that. Um, focus style bef is mitigated by the fact that the focus style for managed fields is a big underline. And uh, so I end up finding my way around and going, OK, I'll focus manage fields, and then I want the next one after that <laughs> tab once. But it's, it's such a subtle focus style that we could improve. Back to the presentation. And uh, just as um, I mentioned uh, I mentioned earlier, we have a, not all templates respect the uh, label display setting for field API, uh, so we want to fix that. But actually, we want to extend that functionality to the block titles. At the minute, you can either have the block title or omit it completely. But we'd like to bring in a visually hidden block title. Sometimes you might run a series of blocks together, but they're actually related, and you don't need a separate heading for them both. Uh, that will be another site builder tool to affect, you know, make decisions about what the accessible experience will be. So those are the things that are currently going on in Core. Uh, I just want to tell you some of the things that uh, we have never touched on yet in Core, really. Um, but we, these are some modest proposals, a little bit of a roadmap, if you will. Can we automate it, have automated testing for accessibility stuff? And the really cool thing is we now have a functional JavaScript test, which, it, which runs uh, interactions in a headless browser. And those headless browsers are capable of running JavaScript. 
So I'm really excited about that. But just to cover the, the sort of strategy or the, the outlook on this, what we're doing here is that accessibility is about managing the whole DOM, the whole document object model. That's the HTML source. And then you style it with CSS. Some behaviors get added with JavaScript. And then the user actually interacts with it and further changes happen. And uh, maybe some ARIA properties get toggled. ARIA expanded true, ARIA expanded false. Maybe the content of that Drupal announce uh, invisible div gets updated with a new message. So we want to know that after the user has done something, uh, the DOM is now still in an accessible state, or that some of the things that we have put in place as screen reader messages are still being announced. So here's some ideas. Uh, I've discovered that Mink, which is part of the um, JavaScript test base, um, it's, it's part of the infrastructure of that, it turns out it can drive keyboard events distinctly from mouse events in its tests. And I'm very excited by this because I mentioned that we had a lot of keyboard accessibility regressions. I mentioned the Ajax buttons had stopped working. Now we have a fix for the Ajax button uh, issue, but could we actually put a regression test in? Uh, the idea is that you would uh, load up the page and you will find your way to the button and focus it. Then explicitly press an enter key using the mink driver and then make your assertion that the form has changed uh, and that means that we can have coverage because the the problem we had is that the, the the ajax button still worked for a mouse click but it hadn't worked for a javascript click uh, the commit that introduced that bug was a a refactoring of the ajax system which made it easier for um, JavaScript authors to, to, to set it up. It was just about making a, a nicer developer experience for the, the methods that are written in code to um, actually make something an Ajax button. But then I hit a snag. It turns out that I wrote a test and I got the test to run and I was really pleased that I'd made my first functional JavaScript test and the test passes regardless of whether you've applied the JavaScript fix. So manual testing confirmed that uh, if I change this line of JavaScript, uh, you know, before the patch, the Ajax button doesn't respond to the enter key, and after the patch, it was responding to the enter key, but the test passed either way. So what was going on there? Well, uh, I had a really useful conversation with Daniel Vayner earlier in the week, and he knows a lot about how that uh, test framework is set up. And it turns out that Mink is just a drive, uh, a wrapper uh, to normalize um, a bunch of other drivers um, which do things differently. All we need to know is a key press and it translates it for the other drivers. Um, it turns out that the, the Goot driver does not support key presses. Um, it turns out that the Zumba driver for PhantomJS that we use with uh, our new functional JavaScript test base I confirmed that that was the driver that was being used with uh, you know, a, a filthy little echo statement for debugging. And uh, yes, sure enough, we're in that class. And it's, if I take out the key press thing, sure enough, the, um, the, the, the key press line of the code, the test, the test will fail. So the key press is happening, it's being registered, but for some reason it's just not behaving expectedly. Um, well, it turns out that we, we may need to switch driver um, and actually test keyboard accessibility, simulate key presses using something like Selenium, which actually you know gets you a browser like Firefox to do it. Uh, that's going to be a, a resource hog if we had to do that for every single um, test in, in core use Selenium. That would just put a big strain on the on the CI setup. So maybe we can use different drivers for different tests, that might be a solution. I've skipped ahead, that's in the later slide. But the idea is that Mink can drive keyboard presses distinctly from mice, mouse actions, so we can build those regression tests in, ideally, if it doesn't just turn out to be a pipe dream. 
Uh, other things we might do with testing is confirm some ARIA relationships. I said that there was a, a template that broke where an ID had been uh, inadvertently removed when cleaning up some classes. Uh, a regression test to confirm that the, uh, the ID referenced by that ARIA described by or ARIA labelled by still exists. This is a way of connecting two elements. It's a bit like the way you have a label has a for attribute that points to the ID of the int in uh, input attribute. It's the same principle. It's an ID reference. This thing could already, already be an uh, Which one? Yeah, so there's a lot of relationships we can do, like um, did we get the right relationships for some uh, custom form elements like, you know, um, our, uh, detail summaries or field sets and uh, or complex compound fields like, um, you know, the, 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 the UI element for something like the format, uh, the, the, the widget for um, uh, the link element. Um, you're expected to provide some link text and provide some um, URL text, and so there's a more as a multi-level compound field set uh, thing. So there's other relationships we can confirm, uh, and because we've got something that can drive JavaScript, and then we can inspect the DOM afterwards, we can make some. Well, we can't write tests, automated tests that drive screen readers yet, um, but we can do a poor man's version of it by doing some changes, going to the toggle button, toggling the toggle, and uh, then confirming that ARIA expanded has the correct value afterwards. So that's the state of the DOM after the user has interacted and caused the DOM to change. That's what we'd be making an assertion about. Is anyone here excited by this? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm excited because we might attract more test writers to learn about accessible expected behavior. Yeah, more people, more, yeah, um, writing tests is also something that holds up issues being fixed. Uh, so here's a quick example, a little bit of pseudocode. We had that uh, Drupal announce, we saw it earlier, we listened to it earlier in the module filter when we typed cache and it told us that uh, now there are only two modules available in the modified list. So the way that we would do it is that uh, this is the div with an ID of Drupal live announcement. Uh, live announce that lives uh, down at the bottom of your HTML footer. So the test would be something like this. This isn't code, this is just uh, the, the process. We load up the modules page and then we go to the module filter and then we type field or cache or something and we'd, we'd, wait, we'd wait for the... We'd, I don't, I'm not sure if we'd have to program the wait. We might have to program a wait while the uh, DOM changes. And then we actually go and inspect the DOM and we'll, we'll go and we'll actually find out how many rows actually still exist. And, you know, it might be eight. And then we'll go and look at what the announcement message says and we're expecting it to say that there are eight modules and it's going to have the right count. So that's just an idea of how we would write a pseudo screen reader test. Exciting? So we do have some questions. The key press doesn't work as expected. Um, I'm interested to know whether we can ask which element has focus um, because uh, we can certainly say find an element and focus it. I want to do it the other way around. I want to say what element has now got focus. Uh, I mentioned the bug that this could uh, test. Uh, in the block placement page on the block, you press place block and the dialogue appears, but the focus doesn't move inside the dialogue, and therefore the dialogue isn't announced. But if our test can say, can assert where the focus is after an interaction, then we can catch, we can guard against that. Mink also takes screenshots. Um, so we can start a test and say, take a screenshot. Um, the question I want to know is, can we actually assert that two screenshots taken during a session are different? So the idea here is that we could load up a page and find a button and say, focus that button, and then take a second screenshot. And if those screenshots don't differ, then we don't have a visible focus style this might need some more thought. Barris is wincing. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know if it's actually something that you can assert, but it's an idea. Could 
It might be that another tool could do it. Cool. Yeah. But I'm not sure if you can. We might not need the coordinates of it though. That's the thing. We just need to say all we have done is focused one button. Yeah. Yeah, the question, the, the, that was a comment, uh, my question, can we test uh, screenshots? A uh, member of the uh, audience in the front row said that actually he thinks they might, it might be possible to do that. So, um, yeah, it's something to follow up on later on. Uh, it's something I need to get into the issue queue for the right people to answer. Windows High Contrast Mode is, anyone ever heard of it? Anyone ever used it? No? Once, yeah. So, also just a quick, uh, how many here are people here are developers or designers or otherwise building websites? Yeah. Uh, how many of you use a Mac? Yeah, it's the same hands. Now here we've got a disconnect with our audience because uh, Windows is still 90% of the desktop market share. Yeah, I think it just dropped <coughs> below 90 for the first time. And... It's a user interaction mode that isn't available on the machines that uh, many developers are using. Uh, so there are many operating systems which offer some kind of tool for um, people who need some kind of adjustment to the color space. Uh, Windows High Contrast is one of those. Um, color Inversion is one of those. Um, and they the tools that are available differ greatly between different operating systems, and they're usually a feature of the operating system. Um, as web developers, we're usually concerned with the differences between browsers, and you know we we also know that if we're we're testing with say Firefox, we know that Firefox on on a Mac and Firefox on Windows, there are very few differences between them. Say, um, but. Windows High Contrast Mode is something that is only available in Windows. Um, the way it works, it's, it's been around for a long, long time, and why I'd like to suggest we support it is because it's very stable and it's made very few changes in the last 10 years or so that it's been around. Um, and it gives you uh, various more extreme color variants, like a light on dark or a dark on light. And here's a, a screenshot of what the Drupal... Uh, you do the standard install, you've got through the install process, bang, you're logged in, and congratulations, you installed Drupal. This is what it looks like. Um, anyone tell me what's wrong with it? Mm, okay, the purple text is fine, but the header is, a, is an interesting one. You see the, the weird dividing lines that we've got in the toolbar? Now, in the normal color space, we see that the top row of the toolbar is black and the bottom row of the toolbar is, is uh, white, and so you can tell the difference between the, the two rows. Here, we kind of don't have a divider line between the top and the bottom, but we do have these weird divider lines between the buttons, and they, um, they kind of just look odd on their own. Any, any other differences? Yeah, the icons have disappeared. Where have our icons gone? If you look at the toolbar, we have uh, uh, there's lots of icons in the toolbar, and they're missing. But all of those uh, buttons in the toolbar have accompanying text label. It's an icon followed by a label. But we can see in the uh, Tom's just mentioned uh, in the search box, we have the search input field, and then we have this uh, rounded corners button with nothing in it whatsoever. No image, no text. Um, over on the other side of the screen, you can also see a little circle. That's uh, because I was hovering over something, and that's a context, contextual quick edit button. Uh, it's just a round circle. We would expect to see a little edit icon in there. Where's our RSS feed gone? Yeah, that's just an icon. You can actually see it because it's got a link underline. It's just the image itself that's missing. And the border on the uh, left-hand side of the congratulations you installed Drupal message is also gone. But we've, we've now got a three-sided box instead of a four-sided box. Um, why is this? This is the effect of high contrast mode. It overrides your colors. That's fairly obvious. It changes the uh, front and uh, background colors. 
Uh, so there we saw the uh, yellow on black, and things like links were a kind of purple. Um, background images are stripped. The, the assumption is that background images are going to interfere with readability because there's going to be text over the top of the images. Um, did anyone look closely at the program for DrupalCon? Uh, the timetables have got icons behind the names of the events, and I think it's quite difficult to read. That's the philosophy of stripping out background images in high contrast mode. But our icons are placed there using CSS background image, but they don't actually have anything overlaying them as text. They've actually got some space reserved for them. Um, our border colors are overridden, uh, but our border style, width, and radius are respected. So we saw those rounded corner buttons. Um, we also saw that the message had a three-sided box, and the big, thick border we were expecting disappeared. That's because three sides are a one-pixel solid border, and the other side doesn't use CSS border. It uses CSS box shadow, and that was out. Um, so can we suggest a fix for that? We can swap that CSS box shadow for a CSS border, and we will... I've tried that. I've messed around in Firebug. I've tried that. It works. So the question now is how much of this survives and how much can we repair? And the reason we want to um, see how much survives is we want to see that some of the same design affordances are carried across so that there's a, a kind of parity, an equivalent experience in this new color space. Um, some of our design, you, you can say, is clearly cosmetic, but there's more to design than cosmetics. Some of it is functional. Uh, you know, we expect to be able to tell row one from row two, and that's why we gave them a different background color. But uh, when we saw that actually you can't tell the difference between background colors because there wasn't any border involved in that. So if you just had a black background and a one pixel black border, well, that border would persist, but it would be changed, it would change its color. Um, some things work really beautifully. Look at the install screen for Drupal, and we've got a batch, a, a batch progress going on, and we see a uh, progress bar. And this, I think, looks really, really beautiful. The colors have been changed, and the uh, uh, fancy animated barber's pole stripe has been taken away, but the essentials are still there. We we can see how far along that progress has gone because that border radius has been preserved. And so we know that this is not just a rectangle divided in two. We actually know that it's a rectangle growing. It's this lozenge that's growing inside. It's something that's filling up. And we see that from that uh, preserved border radius. There's something else that's changed here. In the level where it says install site, we would normally have a, a little, in the normal color space, you see a tag, and it's like a, a beige tag with an, an, an arrow tip. Well, the background color has gone. But then we see this weird yellow ugly square. Where's that come from? The triangle is actually a uh, CSS border hack. So what we have is a, 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 a kind of um, probably a one pixel box with a 50 pixel um, uh, border. And what they've done is they've uh, achieved the triangle by having a uh, colored border on the right and transparent borders around. And the transparent borders are respected but recolored. And so now we just have this big square thing. So there are things we could uh, change. Here's what a dialogue looks like. And how do we recognize that it's a dialogue? Uh, we, we see that the, the page in the background goes out of focus, but we see that, I'm going to need to speed up, we see that um, the thing in front is, has got you know, rounded corners, it's got these headers and stuff, but in a color space of high contrast, that's what it looks like. It's just kind of a bunch of text floating there. What if it looked like that? And that was achieved with one pixel borders, which were transparent. It changes nothing in the uh, normal color space, but provides this extra affordance that tells you this looks more like a dialogue. Yeah, the um, closed button is a background image. Um, techniques we can do, I've talked about the one pixel border, it also applies to outlines, but we can replace CSS background image with generated content. 
Uh, we might also be able to have recolorable icons if we can uh, convince people to use icon fonts. Those are rejected because of a performance concern of having to download a font. Um, I might, I'll briefly run through ARIA usage. This is my last section. We introduced a lot of ARIA in Drupal 8, and now uh, Mike has the idea, Mike Gifford has the idea that we might have used too much. Um, I've also sh shown you there's places where we've, we've got gaps and we could introduce more, um, like ARIA expanded on the toggle button. So the real question is, did we use it well? And there are some emerging practices. This is the getting off the island and proudly found elsewhere part of it. Drupal 8 started five years ago, six years ago, and support for ARIA was still uh, patchy in various browsers and different screen readers had different support for it. That's come on a long, long way. The level of support has increased, and now um, the, uh, the, the authoring, I'm on the wrong slide, the authoring tools was uh, one of the things we brought in um, as a, a new standard, and it was full recommendation a month before Drupal. Uh, was released. Um, we were one of the implementations being tracked. Drupal's implementation of ATAG was one of the things that helped it become a full recommendation. Just as browsers are the things being tracked for making CSS modules a full recommendation, making HTML5 a full recommendation. Well, ARIA 1.1 and ARIA 2 are in the draft stage and there are things coming in there that we could use. And so we might be an early adopter of that. Um, which content management systems are using these things. In particular, there's an accompanying document called the Authoring Practices, and this describes a set of patterns, uh, recipes, if you will, for um, how to use ARIA to create certain widgets. And a couple of weeks ago, in an accessibility conference in Edinburgh, I was fortunate enough to meet the editor of this spec and had a really informative talk about whether Drupal might be able to implement some of these. An example would be, um, it's, it gives you recipes for tab sets and dialogues and things, and I was wondering about whether we might change our vertical tabs, which has been around for about eight years. It started as a contrib experimental module in D6, became part of core in D7, it's still with us, and it's been refactored a bit, but we haven't ever looked at its behavior, and it doesn't have ARIA attributes to describe it as a tab list. So we might be able to implement the uh, tab list pattern in Drupal ourselves. Or we could actually throw out our vertical tabs and look at jQuery UI, which also has vertical tabs, and say, why don't we improve that one and contribute <coughs> upstream? And that way, Drupal has got ARIA vertical tabs, but then so has everyone else who's using jQuery UI got the right thing. So that's just an example of something I think is a an opportunity to get off the island and be part of emerging web standards. Real user testing is something I'd like to bring in. We don't, we, I want validation of our designs because uh, the people who are currently testing with screen readers, we have screen reader users in our community who are you know, self-identified and said, yeah, I use a screen reader, I'll help test this. The downside is that they actually know Drupal very well. And usability testing, we want to take things to people who don't know Drupal very well. Um, they're also power users, and we want to know, we can't assume that everyone with a screen reader uses all of a screen reader's functionality. So some real accessibility user testing will be a great thing. I have zero experience of organizing that. Um, we might want to try and raise some money and get some external agencies to carry that out. We might want to try and run it ourselves. Um, how do we get more... Accessibility contributors, I'm still pondering this, but one of the main barriers is the sheer amount of manual testing that's involved and the sheer uh, learning curve of finding out and familiarizing yourself with how a screen reader works. And, lots of, and of course, they all have different keyboard shortcuts and they all have very different behaviors in terms of what they announce and how configurable they are. And the, the, the actual expected behaviors are something that we would have to educate more people about. So that's a big challenge that I don't really have an answer for yet. I've, I've talked a lot, and we're at 54 minutes, so I haven't left much time for questions, and I apologize for that. Um, <coughs> we might have time for one, one two questions. If Rick. 
Uh, we're having contribution sprints, and Barris has persuaded me that tomorrow we're having an accessibility table at the contribution sprints. Yeah. So, um, Frick. Yeah. Um, thank, thanks a lot. I think this is really interesting and really great. And yesterday we had a core conversation about UI standards. And I think it would be really good if we can, to some degree, actually also coordinate between UI standards and accessibility standards so that we are not coming up with UI standards that don't meet that or that we meet make, make model developers to look here for UI and here for accessibility. Yeah. So if we can actually combine that, that would be really great. And also, for example, I've seen um, we made a list of the type of UI texts we have. And I have yeah. no idea about the announcement text. So we should, for example, take that Yeah, because they're not well. visible, so you, yeah. don't, you don't think about them in your planning as much. Yeah. So if we can maybe on Friday sit together and see how can we in yeah. integrate that better. Um, the other option, um, I've been wondering whether for modules we could actually make something visible to say, I'm pledging to sta stick to... Um, we, we have had that as a kind of a hashtag at, at mm -hmm. points in the past as a D7AX uh, mm -hmm. but um, if, hashtag. If but we could also visually make that visible on the module sites, that also might... Um, uh, you mean more like the security uh, shield icon yeah, that we Yeah, which is provided or, automatically, yeah. I think. But if we have a, something visible to say, we want this module to be accessible, we're trying to, to make it accessible, or we pledge that it will be, um, just to make it more visible to users also when they choose a module. Yeah, that so that helps evaluators and contributors. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. We, we will follow this up. Those are both both great ideas. Yeah, yeah. Just to repeat Barris's uh, comment for the um, for the recording, we uh, my job is to look out for things tagged accessibility in core, but the tag, if you put that on any issue in a contrib module, I will see it. I may not prioritize it, but I'm very happy to uh, help uh, contrib module authors with accessibility issues. It might be good to do that on the basis of something like um, um, office hours. The usability team ran a usability happy hour for a while uh, where you could go and get a, a quick 10-minute uh, you know, expert walkthrough of your UI admin settings and stuff like that. Hi, at the back. Um, in Israel, they recently passed a law that uh, forces all Israeli websites to uh, to be AA grade uh, accessible, and uh, all these uh, companies started popping up and spamming our clients that uh, uh, offering these tools to embed in our websites. And uh, I just wanted to know how how viable are they? How how will they cover that type of accessibility? Yeah, depending on who you ask, uh, which accessibility uh, uh, consultant or enthusiast you ask, you'll find very different opinions on this. The, the, um, I'm not enamored with them. Uh, the, the, we sometimes refer to them as bolt-on accessibility. Uh, an example of this might be you can, you can get kind of screen reader type things that you embed inside a web page. There are various offerings there. But if someone needs a screen reader, they're likely to need it um, for every single web page. And in fact, there are other applications like their um, you know, text editor and file manager on their, on their operating system. So why would what, what would be the benefit of just putting a, a little bolt-on web uh, reader into one particular website? There might, however, be a few use cases for it, like um, if it happened to have a really good voice that knew the sub, that was trained in the, the content of the page. Um, but um, it's not just screen readers. Yeah. It's also like uh, JavaScript applets that change contrast, uh, increase font size, yeah. stuff like that. Some of them work, but um, um, the Windows High Contrast, for instance, is part of the operating system. But there are also uh, things that people <coughs> do to make use of browser plugins, which will just um, that they, they, they'll only affect the, your browser experience, but uh, they'll affect every single web page you visit. And there will be things like toolbar buttons and stuff. Um, of course, um, font increasing and decreasing can be handled by. Uh, browsers themselves, and you can put a, if you use it a lot, you can put a button in the toolbar. Um, so putting things like that inside a web page is, I'm, I'm, I'm generally against, but you will find uh, accessibility specialists who think otherwise and disagree with me. 
Um, it's a big topic. Uh, I, I don't want them in Drupal, uh, is one thing to be saying. All right. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Okay. We're nearly on the hour, so let's make that this is the last question. I'm a bit too small, but... <laughs> so, uh, uh, there's one blind user I'm very concerned with for um, uh, anything Ajax, um, like Google is blind too. Yeah. Also where refreshing pages without refreshes are concerned. Is there any experience that Google reads the Drupal announce? Or might they do it in the future? I hope so. I hope they don't because it's not intended as a search engine optimization. Um, no, but other, other, they um, tend to uh, act like they're blind. They, they tend to use everything that the blind people use also. Mm. What would be wrong if they do, did read it? <laughs> Google presumably, uh, well, as f the, the Drupal announce messages will only appear after user interaction. So um, they follow any link. So we'll kind of uh, assume that for that to happen, Google would have to, Google's bots would have to be uh, doing interactions with the page. They and follow I think, links. A facet's yeah, going links. Yeah, that may well end up happening. Um, I'm not. I I don't know whether it's taken into account by search engines whatsoever. The thing that I would hope, though, is that um, Drupal announced messages are probably considered to be irrelevant. Then they're, they're not what the page is about. So. Um, I don't think they, but, uh, but we do know we, we do know that um, Google have sort of, sort of like prioritized pages based on performance or based on their responsiveness, and who knows they might actually start doing accessibility. Because sometimes changing facets opens uh, content that you want on Google, and if you don't know that something happens when you're blind, you you don't ever see those content types, maybe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's what the Drupal Announce is for. There are uh, there are other libraries. Drupal Announce is homegrown. Um, material design, Polymer. Polymer, that's what I'm thinking of. Polymer has a component that behaves similarly. Um, there's uh, there's um, a jQuery Accessifier has got that ability too. So it's there, there are equivalents outside of Drupal. Yeah. Well, just wondering if you had seen anything. No. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I, I, that might not be the best answer. <laughs> So thank you very much. That was the questions. Lunchtime. Yes.